Bonjour! Bonsoir, dear friends! Welcome to JCB Live! I'm in another galaxy. Dear friends, this is December 21st, and I'm on the moon! I am fulfilling my dream. I'm in zero gravity, and I'm in space. And this has been my dream all my life to one day experience Captain JCB landing on the moon. I was born the year 1969. They went on it. And I've been dying inside and out to go on the moon. And I got so fortunate, dear friends, last year to meet two incredible individuals. They work for the company of my dream. That company is NASA and they love wine and they're passionate and they represent love and the union of what is happening tonight, the closestness of Saturn and Jupiter together representing the symbiotic relationship of the moons and those planets together, they will tell us all about it. I'm so glad we became instant friends. They became a JCB collector. And they're going to bring tonight the world closer to us so we can understand and dematerialize this vision of space that we all dream of since the beginning of time. We all want to go upstairs. So this is why I've put my captain JCB outfit, and I'm, as you could see, coming out of the egg and flying to them. And why do I want to fly to them? Because they're extraordinary people, and they brought me as a gift for my birthday the coolest ever intergalactical gift that is actually older than the moon that is being kept at all time in that safe. Dear friends, I'm very pleased as Captain JCB, representing the bipeds of Earth, introducing the four peds of the NASA Technology Center of California, the fabulous Kimberly, gorgeous Kimberly, sensual Kimberly, and the brain of Joseph. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> We're so from happy to on, see you. You have to call me Captain JC from now on. Captain JCB. How yes, are you? Sir, Captain <laughs> Commander, actually. We should call you Commander. Well, I was, I didn't want to be that pretentious, but if you suggest it, I will. I will go for that. <laughs> you command quite the audience, JCB. <laughs> well, let me suggest that together, oh, and you yeah. should expect us, explain us the meaning of why the bubbles explode and why the corks goes in space and doesn't stay floating in space. Well, uh, you know, we're under pressure here. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Are you ready? I'm coming, I'm coming. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Now the party can begin. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, uh, the little bubbles. So you're having the LV bubble and I'm having French kiss. Because oh, tonight, nice. we wanted to show you two sides of our personality. But dear friends, before we dive into you as you, I want to have a toast to instant friendship. Absolutely. And to the love of life, the love of wine, and today's December 21st, 6 p.m. Something exceptional is going to happen soon. But before that, let's have a toast, a three-way toast. <laughs> and to your fine staff as well. Cheers. So, We'll talk about the wines in a second. Mm, but dear friends, everybody, 
wants to know what Cap Commander JC has in this lovely Agent 69 suitcase that you so kindly offered me for my birthday. So please, Joseph, this is all you. So do you remember how we uh, handed it off to you? Explain everyone, because I do remember, I could never forget. You were running through the Raymond Winery being, I guess you had a handler who was not happy that you stopped to say hello to us as we handed you this secret, top secret suitcase uh, for you to protect the secrets inside. And actually what's inside is a meteorite well, yes. first, you have an amazing Agent 69 take, which is <laughs> yeah. quite incredible. For Agent 69 only, look at this amazing gift. <laughs> Your friends, everybody coming to my house, see it. It's throning on one of the most prominent shelf. And this is for <laughs> Agent 69. <laughs> and it actually is recorded in there that basically tells you what, what is in the box if you choose to accept the mission to protect the secrets of the origins of life trapped in that meteorite. I, think I accept the mission. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so inside that rock is older than our solar system. The, this rock predates a lot of the material that have formed planets in our solar system. And inside are uh, some complex molecules. Um, hey, nice stand. And these complex <laughs> molecules actually seed planets like our own. And we just happen to have an amazing environment here on Earth that's found nowhere else in the solar system. With the, uh, we have a Van Allen belt that protects the radiation belt that protects our planet's atmosphere. And we have a dynamo, which is a liquid metal core that is spinning and rotating inside that allows the earth to maintain its atmosphere where we could live. And then we have a moon that goes around our planet that keeps the earth from wobbling. Otherwise we'd all, and our atmosphere would all wick off and we'd be like Mars or one of the other planets that, that has a very thin atmosphere. And so all of those together help us uh, create an environment where life could actually take hold. And one of the most important things is that we have running water. We have an atmospheric pressure here on Earth, unlike other planets, where water can actually run in liquid form. And humans are 70% water, so that would not be good on any other planet. Because a planet, typically, uh, it's either a gas or an ice where water is on any other surface or small body in our solar system. And so liquid water, the running water is the magic solution that we all life itself uh, have for granted. So when we go out into the universe to try to find other life, we are looking for that running water. We are actually looking for water. And so the cool thing about Jupiter, we think that one of their moons or maybe two of their moons uh, might actually have life. Europa is one. Um, and you'll be able to see that tonight as well. Yes, because binoculars. tell us what is happening tonight. It's amazing. We understand, and Commander will show you his beautiful hairstyle. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's straight because if I go high, it will be this way. <laughs> <laughs> I have it, to wear a hat so it doesn't reflect too much. <laughs> that's it. So enlighten us. It hasn't happened since 1623. Actually, on my birthday, July 16th, 1623. That's pretty cool. Amazing. <laughs> it actually happens, just so you know, if you look at the solar system, it's like a racetrack and the sun is at the center. And so the inside lanes of a racetrack have an advantage for a runner going around because they don't have to travel as far as the person on the outside of the racetrack. So if you figure each of the planets are in each of those lanes of a racetrack, Earth being the third lane and Mars and Jupiter being further out. Jupiter, well, Earth goes around the sun in what we call one year. Okay. And, and Kimberly says 365 days, but Jupiter. <laughs> well, 64, goes, depending on which uh, be six years, right? Absolutely. And Jupiter takes uh, 13 years. Okay. Saturn takes 30 
years. Saturn is much slower because the sun's pull on Saturn is a lot less. But from Earth's perspective, looking at those two planets who are very far away from each other, they very rarely will get very close together in the night sky. But because the orbits are not elliptical in a way that they're in line, they never really have an eclipse of each other because they're actually going in different planes. Some are going at an angle like this and some are going at an angle like this. This is what makes Jupiter and Saturn not always coming together uh, until very rare occasions. But typically Jupiter will outrun Saturn every 20 years. Hmm. But we won't see them get close together unless it's a very rare opportunity. And they actually think in, in the seventh century BC that Jupiter and Saturn came close together in one year, three times in that same year. And, and how so would that happen in that same year that they could come so it, often together when it's because we have to wait? It's because the Earth is rotating itself and it's going around the sun. And it just so happens that at that time, those two planes of Jupiter and Saturn were very close to each other. And so they would constantly, from a different perspective on Earth, uh, it was May 29th, I believe September 9th, and December 5th. But wow. they think that was very special. That may have been the Christmas star. The They're, North Star that we think of. No, we the Christmas, Christmas star, Bethlehem. This is when the three yes. wise men went to King Herod. The birth it, of JC. Yes, that's true. exactly. And so they think that this could be a correlation uh, because it, it was a special event that people noticed mm -hmm. and then it happened again. And so somebody took notice. They think the three magis, the second time it happened, said this is a very important sign. And they, mm -hmm. tr they, they trekked. Uh, and then on December 5th, when it happened again, they went to King Herod to say, where is the son of God who has started? And I believe in that explanation because I'm a huge believer that things like we've met happen for a reason. A divine intervention. A divine so forces coming from <laughs> above. So before we go there, tell us as we today, in 45 minutes from now, at 7 p.m., going to observe here Pacific time, something unusual. So describe us what we need to look for and yeah. what we will see. So what we need to do is when we go outside, we want to look southwest at the horizon. It's going to be very low to the surface. And so we have about an hour, an hour and a half to actually see this event. Uh, you will see Saturn and Jupiter separately they won't necessarily they're at six arc seconds so it's about the the width of a dime if you held it out in front of you and so you will see it it will come closer than that uh, end of that hour? uh no it will in like uh in hundreds of years i think uh what was it uh 2874 december 25th on on christmas on on 2874 it'll be two arc seconds very close but that's a long, long time away. We're still going to be around. Our grandchildren will maybe see it, maybe. Yeah, the brightest will be Jupiter. The second brightest will be Saturn. They'll be pretty close together. And then below Jupiter will be Europa. And then above Jupiter will be Io. Those are moons of Jupiter. And then above Io will be Calypso. So you'll have uh, three moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And in about an hour and a half, it'll dip down below the horizon. And this is why it takes so long for us to see over 400 years, mm -hmm. because most of the time that this has occurred, it's the Southern hemisphere and not the temperate zones in mm -hmm. that most people lived in uh, back in the day. So, so well, it's an exciting this is so event. exciting. Yeah. So have you talked a lot about this within the NASA world you live in as well? Because those occurrences are so rare, that must excite everybody in the scientific world. Well, we're excited because it gives us our opportunity to engage the public in what we do. And so yeah. that's really why it's exceptional. It doesn't do anything to Earth. It doesn't change uh, th this idea of conjunctions happen a lot with a lot of planets, but they don't actually affect the Earth in any way. So you don't have to worry about, you know, any kind of change in, 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 uh, in our atmosphere, if you will. But it does allow us to kind of say, look up in the sky and explore with us. And so there's one other thing happening today. It is also the shortest day of the year. 
So this is the northern winter solstice. So uh, basically at midnight, the moon goes away. And uh, it basically, you can see the moon during the day, which is kind of cool, starting at- So uh, what do you engage uh, into activities that evening or tonight? What are we going to think you and Kimberly are going to be doing? Are you going to have the LV sparkling wine at midnight when the moon is there? And absolutely. I don't think we'll have any of that left by then. Oh, uh, he's because <laughs> we just opened well, I it. I hope you're going to be by the French kiss because this is one of the wines we need to make sure you try. Yes, we love rosé you know, sparkling wine. Well, and this is so fun. This wine, just to give you a little clue on it, fermentation happens to stop in a natural way. This is called the, you know, the authentic method, hmm. and you know. The fermentation stop at around seven and a half percent alcohol, and that's it. Oh, and wow. it becomes a very fruity, very engaging, high volume, opulent style of wine that screams raspberry, strawberry, all the red fruits. Yes. And this is basically a French kiss on its own. So we want to make sure you, Joseph, you show Kimberly your French kiss. That's right. Well, absolutely. But you know what I do love is the smell of it, right? Mm -hmm. The volatiles that come off of it. And some meteorites actually have volatiles that come off. Really? It's interesting, it's interesting that these volatiles, uh, that shows you complex molecules. And it's those complex molecules that are trapped in your meteorite that they're long gone now. You don't really smell them. Yep. But uh, <laughs> I'm leaking her. She tastes very good. I had, a, I had a little boy in Hawaii lick it and say it tastes like chocolate and it made the front cover of the newspaper. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, it tastes like Pinot Noir. <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's go back to this amazing gift that you were so, I was so touched, as you know, when you so kindly offered it to me. And I cannot believe this is a meteor that was there before the moon. So would you, in simple term, explain us all that and why we should collect what maybe falls from the planets and fall from the sky? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, to, to really quickly, uh, you know, the, the universe is filled with dust and dust actually comes together through static charge. And so in space, there's, it's super cold in the dark, <laughs> But as the dust kind of goes by each other, it creates a static charge and it clumps together. And yeah. as that clumping happens, the meteorites basically start to, they're not meteorites until they actually hit the ground. I, I, I should, you know, preface that. They're a little I see. So the name comes as they hit the ground, right. then they may become a meteorite in other right. words. Because it's a meteor when it's flying through the atmosphere. It's an asteroid or uh, a you know, small space material, if you will. So in this case, you know, we have a meteorite here that's kind of interesting and it's a, wow. a lot of material. And so it basically, as the uh, dust comes together, if you clap your hands, you can feel this friction, this heat, it's like a little mini explosion. Well, a lot of that dust, when it comes together, creates that heat. And what happens is it melts. And the material, the dust, has all kinds of different molecules in it. And the heavier molecules will melt to the center of the object as it grows. And if it gets bigger, and we're talking millions of tons of material, when it gets really big, it starts to create a gravity well. And so that's attraction, right? It's, a, it's like an attraction. Yeah, it's like an yeah attraction. I was going to say, not to interrupt you, of course, but uh, when you looked at Kimberly's eyes, did yeah. you feel like you were a meteor because you kissed her and suddenly you started to meld together, right? Is it what happened? Actually, it was her voice. So Ooh. I didn't even see her. I was all the way across the room at Kennedy Space Center. For oh, I thought you called one of those very interesting phone numbers and you meet someone on the other side of the line. It was that electrical <laughs> that electrical charge in the air that just pulled me to her. Anyway, when I, uh, when I saw her, I obviously was attracted to her, but I loved her voice. And so, oh, so you were both, sorry, I'm digressing. We'll, we need to go back to this as well. But so you met on the telephone as two scientists from, Napa, from NASA. Oh, 
actually, we went to a, it was a robotic competition that I was uh, one of the founders of. And I was late because I flew from California to Florida to Kennedy Space Center. And Kimberly was the MC, the master of ceremonies. And I never met her before. I just kind of walked in and, and because I arrived, they were waiting for me. And so for hours they were waiting for me. And when I finally arrived, they started the, the whole program and she, I just heard her voice. There was hundreds of people in the room. And so uh, I was like, who is that? That sounds amazing. <laughs> She's got this wonderful radio voice. And I told her father that, and he was like, oh yeah, right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you scientifically explain the fact that it was meant to be that you are together now? Well, I'll let her serve some you. white wine with uh, that because John Legend would be the most romantic wine to have with us. Absolutely. You well, me back. just so you know, she does play piano. Uh, she's an avid piano player and she loves John Legend. So that's one reason more why- More aspiring than anything, but yes. That's why we have his, one reason we were drawn to his wines, uh, you know, and, and your, your wines was because of, of her piano playing. But uh, I'll, I'll let her explain it because she was the aggressive one. <laughs> Ooh, I'm gonna turn the egg into, into the cocoon. I wanna hear more about the aggressive Kimberly because Kimberly, is there any scientific explanation of why people are attracted molecularly to each other? I think you're, you and, have to nail it. And I serve the white Chardonnay, by the way, just for oh, you to, okay. you're bouncing to around. tell us how you feel about it too. <laughs> Oh, you know what? While she's telling you, I will open that up. Yeah, we'll, we we'll put this to the side. I think there's a lot to be said with chemistry, you know, about the chemistry between people. Sometimes you just know, and it does not, it's effortless, right? I mean, when we met you, for instance, honestly, we'd never, we never really knew your, the breadth of your uh, participation in the Napa Valley. And we're so thankful that we met you on our terms versus being these, you know, fanfare people or, you know, groupies, if you will. And, and it was a magical encounter. I mean, you had the passion you tell us we have, but you, you really captured the notion of the alchemy of the senses, right? And we fell in love with just how friendly you were and how genuine you were to get to know us. And so while Joe's opening up the Chardonnay, um, <laughs> I'm so thankful he has multiple tasks going on. Um, we, we just became, you know, like admirers right off the bat Thank of you. personality and we had a lot in common. So a lot in common how it works, you know, but not to, not to digress to how we've met. Tell us about this chemistry that you both had that became love at first sight, in other words. And and how do you explain it scientifically? Because I know yes. you're both a scientist. You have an explanation for everything. Well, we think we do. Right. Um, you know, with regard to Joe and I meeting, um, you know, we worked at NASA for the, the better part of the same time frame, you know, 20 years in on each coast. I was in Virginia, he was in California. And it was the kindred appreciation of the work that we do as an agency. You know, I finally met somebody who completely understands what happens at NASA and how knit, knit tight a group we are. Uh, we really do a lot of work in space and aeronautics and earth science research. However, we do even more I, on earth. And a lot of it has to do with just making sure we understand our own climate and climate change and you know the changing world we live in and how can we manage crops and look at all the you know technology developments that have come out of it. The way we can yeah. virtually see you and do this call uh, telephones and cameras in your cell phone. I mean, laptops, for instance, so much comes right back down to earth. And so because we understand that now that we're, we're together, it, we don't even have to say it. We just look at each other. And it, uh, <laughs> I can see the two meteor getting together and melting those yes, two dust yes. and landing into earth. Now, uh, Kimberly, as you mentioned that, Maybe you should uh, just briefly tell us the insane, incredible invention that NASA triggered, because a lot of people think NASA is only about space, but space help us to solve right. tremendous amount of innovation and creation on Earth. Well, everything from, you know, gosh, I guess the 
very big, you know, spinoffs. We call them spinoffs because they're a spin on technologies we use for missions and projects. But if you think about as our first experience going to the moon with the Apollo astronauts, we started benefiting from technologies based on what they had to take with them in space. You couldn't take this multi-unit wall, you know, room size computer on the Apollo capsule. You couldn't do that. So they had to miniaturize computers and bring them in a mobile portable fashion, which now we use as laptops. The very first laptops were because they had to send a computer up to space with the astronauts on the space shuttle. And Fantastic. And the toilets, you know, we didn't have like running water on the space shuttle, but airliners use the same technology of a portable toilet that you can take on an airplane. And, and the International Space Station now has toilets that are made for space environment. And um, there's so many things that we, we can share about. Um, and we have a website. Telephones, cell phones, you know, the chips. The computer it, itself. So yeah. miniature controls were actually invented with a grant from NASA to a woman at Stanford who had this idea that you could actually miniaturize transistors. And because of that, she did a proof of concept. And that proof of concept, Texas Instruments took and exploited the whole idea of making a computer chip all because of the Apollo missions. Right. Power uh, drills with the batteries, you know, these DeWalt power drills you get? Yes. Well, Decker was the company that was uh, contracted by NASA to make a battery operated drill for an astronaut to work outside of the Apollo capsule. It looked just like our today's drills with the battery pack on the bottom, except it was chrome. It was really cool looking. Right. But, uh, you know, things that we take for granted, it's absolutely amazing. The camera, the, the little camera on a chip, that's a NASA technology. And a really quick, funny story about it is we didn't know what to do with it. We're thinking, what else could we use this for? It was for a spacecraft. But we're thinking, oh, you know what? Spies could use this. Spies. Agent 69 Agent could totally use this. <laughs> it just so happens, though, that the spy industry is a very small industry. Not so, a lot of customers. In not there, a lot yeah. of customers. So it, it got shelved. And and then a, a little company you may have heard called Nokia basically heard about it and said, hey, we have a bunch of Japanese, Japanese teenagers. teenagers that love to take pictures of cute things. And we're going to make a phone and we're going to put a camera in the phone. It's not going to be that great quality, but it doesn't matter because these girls in Japan love to take pictures of everything. And so NASA licensed it to them, an international company, which by the way, we have a whole suite of technology that it's you, available. anybody in the United States, they can be a nine-year-old kid who has an idea about filtering water. They can license technology from NASA and start their own business. And Kim wow. is in charge of doing that at Ames Research Center. Every center has somebody that does that. And so if you're interested in any of that stuff, look on invention.nasa.gov. <laughs> and, and that's it. No, it's so cool that you're mentioning that because people often, as I'm a huge fan, you gave me a beautiful T-shirt. My daughters love it. You gave me a bag of NASA. I'm an enormous fan of it. Besides loving the logo, I love what it means and the concept of that audacious creativity and scientific advancement. And nobody knows necessarily how to approach NASA. So by just giving us this advice, and making the patented process easier and allowing people to create, I think, is brilliant. So it's a major incubator, in fact. Yes, it absolutely. Is. Yes, you, it is. It's your tax dollars at work. The technology was paid for by you. Already. And so it is available to you to license. And that's why we have those really soft beds, you know, those Tempur-Pedic. Tempur-Pedic. And why they have these special gold on, on sunglasses. That's what the astronauts have to protect from the sun, mm -hmm. the UV protections and stuff like that. And so yes. Even Water race car drivers, race car drivers and firemen benefit from the material science that are fire retardants. And it's all because we explore places that are not familiar to us on earth and we have to invent things for those environments. And so those, those constraints are where innovation happens because we take everything for granted on earth. Why yeah. would you care? about protecting water mm -hmm. on earth because we have so much of it right but actually on a you, know, you go up into space you won't have any of it 
And is it really life- true? Because I heard recently there was maybe a little water on Mars. Is it true or not? Yes, there's water all over the solar system, but just just not in, in a way that you are familiar with. So, and when you break a rock open and it cracks, it, it leaves openings for hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hydrogen and oxygen molecules actually adhere to the, to the broken uh, uh, connections when you break rocks and things open. Molecules. I see. Okay. And so when, when it's cold, there's 500 degrees difference between the shade and heat. Mm-hmm. So when an astronaut puts his hand out into the sun, it's 500 degrees hotter than the shadow part. That's why they got to wear those suits. It's crazy. They have to be able the to have that fire. The temperature would kill. <laughs> but, but think about that. When the surface of a planet sees the sun, it's not protected like we are by our ozone. Mm-hmm. And so it cooks off that area. And so as the heating of the rocks happen, the hydrogen o- oxygen molecules rise. And what do you think they do? They get attracted. Mm-hmm. Ding, 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 ding. That's and there's right. water. There's water. There's water. And what happens is sometimes it gets... Uh, through static charge, this water molecule might get trapped. We call it a, it's like an ice trap, if you will, in a permanently shadowed crater. So on the moon, on the top and the bottom are these deep craters because the oblique angle of the sun never reaches the bottom of the crater. It's filled with ice. Oh, I see. Mine it. <laughs> in fact, the coldest place that NASA has ever recorded, recorded now, is at the bases of those craters on the moon. And what temperature would that be? And the surface of Pluto. And what temperature would that be? It's uh, oh, I don't know, can I? Can I it's can something I, we cannot even measure. We don't have the yeah. unit. Well, so it's, it's, Kelvin something? it's yeah, it's very close. Uh, it's not absolute zero, but it gets pretty close. It's like 400, negative 400 degrees or so. Wow. But the surface of Pluto we can only record the reflection on the right. sun side of it. So because of that, yeah, that is slightly, just very little bit warmer than these places on the moon that have never seen the light of day in over a billion years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's that amazing. <laughs> you know, you mentioned there's water in rocks as an example. We have 85% water in wine. Yeah. <laughs> is it a miracle as well? Huh? So, Kimberly, you're going to tell us what does this wine make you feel and sense? This is the LVE Chardonnay from the Napa Valley that we make with John Legend. And as you love to sing, you have that very sensual voice that Joe was referring to that made you sing too. <laughs> oh boy, here we he go. He vibrated hearing your voice. Maybe you give us a little song of, of how it makes you feel before we go back uh, to science. Well, all of this wine really has, uh, a, it's, it's a spin out from what you created in our collection we have already. And you know, I think John Legends is, is all of me. And I feel like it's all of, all the like, it's got the smoothness, it's got the texture, it's not overly sweet, but it's not bitter. It's got like this very cashmere feel on my tongue. Ooh. I'm really excited about the Chardonnay. I'm not sure if I've even tried this one before. It oh, must it's be new. We, we have tried it. We have? Well, I'm thankful that I have no distractions on my taste buds right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it's it. Amazing. It's really, it's one of my favorites, I think. And I we don't keep enough whites in the house because it's all really fast. <laughs> but we well, need to stockpile this. This one's really good. Well, you're going to make John extremely happy. I'll make sure he sees... Mm this fabulous and hear your description. Absolutely. And I love the idea of the description of cashmere. Mm-hmm. This is so well said as a fabric yeah. texture. We could totally imagine what you mean if we don't have with us the wine. It's that freshness that so. stays with you. Yes. There's yes. a lasting buttery flavor that just stays in mm-hmm. your mouth and it's just so soft and oh, I love this wine. Mm-hmm. We did see your last, uh, uh, interview with John Legend and he sang on his way out, oh, which was just it. incredible. Wasn't it fun? <laughs> I loved it. I yeah. was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm watching this. <laughs> yeah, big, big, so, big fan. So on that note, tell us about one of the things you can divulge that you're working on 
that is an extraordinary breakthrough within the world of NASA. Something you could share that you think is so cool for all our friends with us from all around the world tonight. You know, mm -hmm. in December, we have friends with our JCB Live everywhere. And they're so excited about this session because of what's happening tonight and the both of you. How about I give one and you give at least one? Oh yeah, I got a couple. So I know I, I wanna I wanna share with the audience who's watching because we're huge fans, obviously, of what you've been doing in Napa. But NASA, we mentioned it a little bit Thank earlier. You. NASA actually sends wine to space to understand the aging process because we have a, a small amount of time that we can spend in space without degrading our, our human body. I mean, we age faster when yeah. we send rodents up that we use for bone mass exploration and understanding medical effects and radiation effects. We Michael. also look at wine. Mm -hmm. We can do it in a small amount of time and get so much information out of in microgravity how wine actually ages. So when the aging process is tested in so many ways, we can really take advantage of the microgravity aspects. One thing that's really cool about it is the comp components during the aging process will act differently in microgravity than here on Earth. And so that's one reason why we have these these experiments that we take to the International Space Station. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, maybe this is, this is something you, you must be doing with my lovely wife, too. And that's maybe something she did not divulge and kept as a secret. Maybe she she gives you wine to. It say. is a French. Uh, it is a French researcher, and the name of the mission was called Wise, and it's a Latin acronym for Great Wine in Distant Experiment. That's oh. kind of essentially what it means <laughs> in Latin. It's kind of loosely interpreted that way. So it's a it's an acronym, Wise. Oh, and then but it, you, you know what you're both mentioning here is fascinating because you know to accelerate the aging process of wine, mm -hmm. it's very true going up or going down for that matter. We've aged wine in oceans and I've realized that wine may have an accelerated propensity to age. Mm -hmm. The tannins become emphatic and smoother. The oxidation of the wine happens faster maybe on the whites, mm -hmm. but not in a negative way where we start to get secondary and tertiary flavor. Right. So it's actually fascinating. So how do you explain it? Well, so you have uh, the way salts and pathogens work in microgravity are very different than that here on Earth. And um, that's kind of what we're uh, trying to understand is what those differences are. You know, it, yeah. it'd be, it, it, so taking wine up there and seeing how it ages differently, you know, has to do with the living organisms that are working, the yeast and stuff working in a microgravity environment, mm -hmm. right? But what's really interesting and what hasn't been done, JCB, and we know researchers that might be interested in doing this, is growing grapes in space. We grow potatoes, we grow lettuce. We I'm ready. And the reason why is because vines, vines grow in a sprawl and it's hard to keep them lit correctly in a small so we need to find a way to make these vines more compact which by the way you could appreciate having more vineyards in a smaller space right that would be a really cool thing but and the fermentation the process is very difficult in space because gases and liquids don't like to interact in space so we might have to find another way that research has not been done yet and well, if you were to ask me to give you some vines that we could together plant in space, I'm in. Okay. So right. It's recorded, it's on tape. <laughs> we would be delighted because, you know, one of my dream, born in 1969, as I said earlier, was the moon. And, you know, in France, we were very riveted on the American dream and all encouraging that famous day in July saying we hope it succeeds and it did. And I've always been dreaming of going into space in whichever form on whichever planet. So I know the moon has been done already. So can we please go to Jupiter, Saturn, Mars? You <laughs> name well, it, I'll go up. We do want to go to Europa because we there is an ocean, a liquid ocean underneath the ice. 
And so we, we, we think that there, if there's going to be life in our solar system, mm -hmm. that might be where it is. And, and so what's really exciting is if we can find life that independently started anywhere in our solar system besides Earth that's not from Earth, mm -hmm. that's exciting because that means life is everywhere in the universe, mm -hmm. which we have an idea could be because the volatiles. So meteorites, you know what's special about why I love meteorites so much, right? Yes. <laughs> this is a space mission that comes to me. I can study the, the, our solar system, you know, how it formed, how our planets formed, just by these rocks. I can find the molecules that are here that are not found on the surface of Earth. They're found deep, deep down inside. So a metal, you know, meteorite like, oh, like this, one. this one is super, super heavy, right? But you have quite a collection at the house. Oh yeah, look at this. It this, weighs like 50 pounds. This and meteorite, <laughs> I, I traded it. I traded with uh, the Museum of Natural History, and this is this is what they gave me in the in a trade for. You're gonna love it. I, I found a, a dinosaur tooth at an estate sale, and I I didn't really care for fossils because I can find fossils everywhere, so I don't really appreciate them. And the guy that he knows I don't really appreciate fossils, so he's like, he takes my he takes my dinosaur tooth that I found. It was actually a woolly mammoth tooth, and he comes back. He goes, "What do you want?" And I'm like, "Well, I always wanted a space rock." Now, this is how long ago it was. And he comes back and he plumps this 12 pound meteorite and he goes, what else? <laughs> and so wow. it was basically going to an estate sale. Somebody passed away, I guess. And I went down in the basement to look for a tools and stuff that, you know, mm -hmm. and it was a pile of rocks in the corner and they weren't for sale because they were just saw it as a junk. And I found one and I thought, oh, what a cool rock. And I said, how much? And they're like, it's, it's not for sale. You can have it. And I say, I feel bad because I think it's like obsidian or something. And they said, we'll buy something. So I bought a 50 cent basketball and walked away with a rock. And I, I, I scraped off the clay and it was a mammoth tooth, the, the root and the enamel top, which is super rare. Why didn't we keep that? Well, the Museum of Natural History thought, <laughs> oh, we need this missing link. And that you always got to bring things to researchers to say, is this important? Because I yeah, don't sure. think it's not important. And so this is from Meteor Crater which is one of the most well-preserved craters on earth in, in Arizona. And so this is a, an iron, it's got black diamonds in it. Ooh. Wow. And so Gorgeous. you know how Superman used to squeeze carbon? Of course. That's exactly what happens here. When the melting differentiation of material, of dust that hits the surface of a planetary body, because of the heat and pressure, the heavy stuff sinks to the center mm. and the center gets denser and denser. So this is super heavy, probably closer to the middle of that, that core. Mm. And the even denser material can be found that's actually more right at that core. And then it gets all the way up to the surface, you get material that's less and less dense. And so there is another meteorite that's really cool. Mm. I have to show you, it's called a palisite. It has what a collection, what a treat you're giving us today. Look at this, see this? Those oh, are gemstones. leopard print. Yes, so those are actually olivine. They're green crystals and they're found in the mantle. Have you, you, I don't know if all you people remember, there's a crust, there's a mantle and a core in the planetary uh, layer. I remember that, of course. Yeah. Cross the so, mantle, yep. So I don't know if we have a flashlight. Oh, wow. Oh, we see it, it's stunning. Hold yeah. on a second. Let's see if we can we can do this. It's a metallic. Looks like oh oh of course. It's like a stained glass. It's yeah. Glass. And those oh, are green, la, la. actual gemstones from space. They come. Uh, they're well. Peridot is another name for it in in a jewelry store. You might find peridot. It's a green. But yes. all of them is, is the term given to a less Jemmy quality. And so see right through this. It's pretty cool. Um, and then you have the one that I gave you, which is something that you would find more on the surface of a planetary body. And so look at that. Yeah. We're gonna put it right metal. here. So you could see <laughs> very close. Dear friends, look at that. Oh yeah, you have some. It's got little <laughs> bits of metal in it still that haven't because that rock was not made in a planetary uh, in a planetary process. That rock you're holding there actually has stardust in it as well. Yes. Yes, I see it. And now that I'm leaking it, it's shining <laughs> even more. So the oh, um, it's so very the, essential. Did you believe I I developed such an affection that it's becoming 
a tool that excites me even more than ever. Well, that brown surface is actually what happens when it cooks, when it comes through the atmosphere. And it's about a hairline thickness of brown oh, yeah. there you go. melted, uh, we call it fusion crust. And if you can see the little broken area, the rock yep. inside is actually quite light. It's not a dark rock. It's only that surface. And that's right. one way you can tell that you found a meteorite. If you break it open and there's a really thin, mm. dark crust. Mm. And the other thing is if you take a magnet, there is little tiny metal particles in that that are actually magnetic. So those two things might allow somebody to say, hey, do I have a meteorite? Well, right. check. Does it have, is it white inside? Does it have a thin fusion crust? Does a magnet uh, adhere to it? If so, you might have a meteorite and you might want to go further and check it out. This is so cool. cool? And this one came, where, where did it land? So that landed in Northwest Africa. And so basically all meteorites are land, uh, named after the nearest post office. <laughs> you said the post office. Yes. And so the nearest post office, because they're government entities, they're official entities, that is the name given to a meteorite when it's felt, when it's uh, like identified. But there are two places on earth that meteorites last for a very, very long time. And there are no post offices. One's Antarctica, and one is Northwest African desert. And we're not allowed to go into the desert to hunt them because a lot of the uh, Arabic tribes that, that go through the desert, they don't want you to go, they don't want us to go get those meteorites. They know they're valuable. And so they bring them into Morocco. And so Morocco is a staging area for a lot of these rocks. And we don't know exactly where they fell because they're secret. They don't I want to I feel like we need a trip to Morocco. Uh, I think we should. Or to Oakville Grocery, because we have a post office <laughs> at Oakville Grocery on our parking lot, which is the Oakville famous P.O. Box. Love it. I bet you there are meteorites in Napa. <laughs> and I bet you there are meteorites in Napa because of all that agriculture. Whenever a plow goes through that farmland, yeah. if it hits a rock, it wasn't there last year. <laughs> and so- Very true. Exactly. And so the interesting thing is that's typically, so the Midwest, we find tons of meteorites because of that. The farmers would take the rocks and they throw them in their backyard. Right. They didn't know what they were. And so we found lots of really rare meteorites that way. Wow. I love it. So anyone, if you found one of those, Kimberly, Joe, and I'm the assistant, Agent yeah. 69 will work on it with you. <laughs> So oh, on that note, send them to JCB and I'll come down and check them out and see if they're meteorites. And we'll taste wine. <laughs> we'll taste wine over there. And I'll give you JCB number three oh. because it's the best of both worlds, right? So we're going to now drink our favorite wine. And I'd oh. love for you, as we enjoy this wine, which is the blend, as you know, of two parts of the world. And I'm delighted we honoring this wine together before we go outside and look at Saturn and Jupiter, yes, because it's really, you know, this one is the blend of two worlds. So, mm. you know, Burgundy and the Russian River, blend of love, of passion, of two worlds. But wouldn't it be great if we could blend a wine from Earth and, as you said, <laughs> a wine maybe from another planet? Would what be would be your favorite uh, Kimberly planet that oh, you'd man. like to grow grapes on? You know, I, there's, you know, there's this debate about Pluto being a dwarf planet, therefore it's no longer called an actual planet, but you know, short people are humans too. So for me, <laughs> so I think it should be a Plutonian name, you know, something really cool that speaks to the farthest distance from earth and from, you know, what we know of as our immediate little circle of planets. So something with an origin that uh, speaks to distance and uh, still being included, you know, and diversity. And I think, you know, it, it's an outer realm, Pluto, you know, but it's still in my nine planetary memory from school. So I, I, I vote for Pluto. Oh, I love that. What, what about you, uh, Joseph? Well, before we go there, let me just explain to people really quickly, Pluto as a dwarf planet, okay? <laughs> It, it is an actual planet, but the reason why we had to change the nomenclature is we found over 2,000 objects beyond Pluto that are going around the sun. That would change the size of our solar system dramatically, and kids can't remember more than nine planets. So 
brilliant. We had to make something <laughs> to kind of start to identify all the new objects that we're exploring <laughs> beyond Pluto. Pluto is very, very tiny compared to our moon, yeah. which is very, very tiny compared to us. And so you can imagine a moon that's half the size of our moon with its own moon. By the way, the really cool thing about, about Pluto is it has a moon that's anchored to one part of it. So no matter how Pluto changes its direction, that it moon the same. is almost like it's been bolted on to that place. Mm -hmm. and really? It's, it's actually really cool because as we go into space deeper, we're finding that big objects they don't collide together sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they slowly come together and then they just kind of hold each other in their gravity. And so the one issue we have with asteroids that we look at, we don't know if they're a loose pile of rocks being mm -hmm. held together or they're an actual solid piece like this. So if we need to move an asteroid, if we need to move an asteroid, say an asteroid's coming toward Earth, we are, we are capable of saving all of humanity if we have enough time. Because all we have to do is push it one centimeter from very far away, and it will nearly miss Earth instead of hit Earth. And we just have to nudge wow. it. And so, so but we have to be careful. If it's a pile of rocks just holding each other, you'll move one and they just break apart. And now we have buckshot coming at the, you know, so we have to be very careful what, very we're, what we're doing. We're learning how these things are being held together. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, the moon, I would rather us see if we could grow things on the moon because the moon is 239,000 miles away. It's a three we day. We can get there in three days. It's a three day trip. And so <laughs> I think if we can learn to grow things on the moon, we can learn to grow things anywhere because it's drier than any place on earth. And also everything that's on earth is on the moon, but just in the form you don't recognize. Right, that's true. All of the molecules can be synthesized on the moon. And so when you were asking about technology that we're working on, that's what I'm more a part of. I have a planetary well, soil mechanics lab. And I, I love the fact that you're mentioning the moon because I'd love for you to explain us as we drink this, you know, organic and biodynamic wine that is following the lunar cycle. It's a perfect time. Cheers to both of you. I love your glass, by the way. Can you hear the sound again? Ooh. I love the, the, ooh, la, 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 la. Makes me shiver of excitement. And it goes on and on and on. It goes on and on, reverberates. So yeah. the relationship of the moon to create ebb and flow of the ocean and the polarization of the moon, the magnetic energy of the moon. Why don't you give us a great explanation why it makes sense to follow the lunar calendar in a scientific way in terms of agriculture? as an example? Well, so it's real easy, JCB. The moon has a field that affects every molecule here on Earth. Everything. OK? And so the fact that Raymond Winery, in fact, this is, was really interesting to me. Um, I study the moon. But when I went to Raymond Winery, you have that beautiful demonstration garden where you talk about you. Uh, what some of your winemakers do. and. OK, so the water tides that move on Earth, everybody knows the tidal uh, mm -hmm. pull that the moon has on a daily basis. Well, it just so happens that at certain times, kind of like tonight, where you have this half view of the moon, that first yep. phase, OK, the first phase is known to have a wetter soil. And that's because it goes from full moon to that first quarter the moon has the most dramatic pull oh, wow. gravitationally to Earth. And it pulls the water up closer to the surface. That's and therefore, it. you can use it to grow things better. You can use it to uh, transplant things. If you're going to do grafting, you can do all kinds of things. It's going to be better to, to do that. Germination rates. We can actually see germination rates change. We can see better plant metabolism. We yeah. can see the groundwater. So well, more access is, to it because it's now exactly. pulled up to the surface. Exactly. So, you know, and we can actually see the representation, uh, what is it, the uh, respiration of animal, uh, plants change mm -hmm. with that gravitational pull. And so in the first quarter, which is kind of what today is, is basically that first we get to that half moon cycle, which yep. is really cool to see. 
it's also a really good time to look at the surface of the moon because you're seeing the sun at a very oblique angle reflected on the moon and you can really see surface features, especially along that dark edge. You're going to see the peaks of the mountains if you have a very good clue of it. And sometimes you might see a little spark. A little spark. <laughs> and that's a meteorite hitting. And you'll see that little explosion just in that shadow area. And it's like, oh, cool, a meteorite just hit the moon. So, um, so that, that's good. And in fact, um, what is it? Today, first quarter, it's 7 o'clock. Oh, so around 7 to midnight, OK, or 1 o'clock, there is an actual view of the moon tonight that you can see where two craters mm -hmm. The, the splash of all the debris has made almost a perfect X in the in the southern. Oh, portion. really? Yes. Yeah. And, and they call yes. it the lunar X. And it's very difficult to see, but tonight is a perfect time to see it. And be, at about 7 p.m. I'm going to fly p. there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> from, from about well, 7 p.m. Very... So as we have a few minutes before we go out, because it's almost 7 o'clock and we all want us to experience what we've been talking about, give us, as two phenomenal scientists, researchers, brains within the world of space and innovation and creation, what is your dream that you'd like to see happening at large in space? I, I would like us to actually go into space with humans a lot more than we are currently doing. I would like to see the moon become like Antarctica, a research station that we could yes. go to and learn about our, our environment. Because being a one planetary species is, is not very safe. And so being able to venture out and as we change our physiology, as we leave the planet Earth indefinitely, we will change as a species to adapt to those environments. Right now, our, mutants, you know? our bones are yeah. made to support this gravity, but on Mars, it's 40%. On the moon, it's like 6%. So you can imagine the physiology of these people that will live there on a permanent basis. They may never be able to return, but they will start their own colonies and they will start their own thing. Imagine a person in space that's in a space station. They don't need feet anymore. They might have four arms in the future. <laughs> I mean, think about that. For sure. More, more hands to hold more wine, right? Oh, but, I love it. it. There's one more thing I wanted to tell you that's really interesting. We've been doing a lot of research for the wine industry, and there's a bunch of missions that we have that you know we're happy to t tell you about. Mm -hmm. But mainly, satellite observations of vineyards. We can tell from the micro little sections of a vineyard where the grapes are best. We can mm -hmm. actually tell you when you look at a plant a and it looks healthy, we can tell you that that uh, root louse is eating it, even though you can't see it because the plant looks healthy. We could tell you from a satellite image that mm -hmm. that, is, that is a sick plant. Ooh. Very important for winemakers, especially- We should, we should talk very soon. <laughs> yeah. And here's one more thing. As you've heard, everybody's heard, red wine is good for you. For what reason? There's something in it. Heart healthy. Right? Reservatol? Yes, resveratrol, yeah. Guess what that does for astronauts if they were to use it? It helps protect bone density. And so when you are in space, you yes, don't I have know. the gravity and, and the, uh, the pull on your muscles to keep you healthy. But reservatol, actually helps delay that. Mm -hmm. And so if you have sedentary people on Earth because they got uh, an accident or they're Injuries, bedridden, yeah. nothing will replace exercise. But in the event that you can't, maybe a reservatol uh, supplement or as or I like more to, wine. Or I, I mean, like I'm okay with more another wine. Another glass of wine. <laughs> That's might actually help. help. And we won't know unless we research this in space to right. see how this affects because they're like sedentary people up there because they're not getting the effects of gravity here on Earth. But an astronaut living on Mars is not going to have the same capability as they do here on Earth as the human being. And so they might need reservatoire. We might need to grow wine on Mars. Might be a lot easier than we think as well. 
I'm ready. Whatever you do it, can you make sure we're the first vintner ever to do it? That would be my I'm not dream. calling anybody except you. What are you talking about? <laughs> Done. Well, there's a lot of research do it. that goes on. But yeah, we can actually fake the environment and kind of, you know, I, I have a soil mechanics lab at Ames Research Center, and we're looking for ways to test uh, soil. Mm -hmm. uh, we have engineered regolith, and we're learning about in situ research uh, utilization, which means when I go to a planet, I'm not bringing my water, I'm not bringing my building materials. I'm going to have to live off the land right there. So sure. how, do I, how do I get the rare metals out? How do I get the water out? How do I keep water in a liquid form? How do I uh, make bricks, building material? By the way, if you have a foot thick of regolith, regolith is basically soil that is not tumbled. When you look at sand, it's got all round edges. Eroded and it, it, Because it's been tumbled because of weathering and rain and all that stuff. Well, that doesn't happen on another planet. When you have pulverized material, it's sharp, jagged edges. And when you push it with a bulldozer, it's like pushing steel. But when you're running a wheel over it, it's like talcum powder and you mm -hmm. could dig yourself into a hole. But if you try to push it, it won't move at all. So there's all these neat ideas that we have to learn. So that's kind of the technology we're working on. I love it. Yeah. You're so far ahead. This is so exciting. Well, this was so enlightening. And having a Pinot Noir yeah. with us as number three, which is the best Resveratrol of California and Burgundy, we have our plan and we have our bone will be protected as we go up and spend a few months. Absolutely. So we agreed to plant grapes on Mars. I love it. Or the moon, for that matter. Both. Absolutely. So now, as we... We're going to all go outside, of course, and look at this amazing uh, union or closeness of Saturn and Jupiter. I'd like both of you to leave us with a message. This is December 21st. You're very wise. Your mind is at 239,000 miles away, as you said. <laughs> so even though it takes only three days to get to your mind, uh, we want to get there quicker. So give us your message to the world, to all the people with us tonight and who will be viewing this program because it's so exciting. For me, I need all of you who are just dying to know more about NASA, just visit us at NASA Home and City, nasa.gov, like government, and you will be amazed at how much NASA is everywhere you are. It's in your workplace, it's in the medical industry, it's in the sporting arena, it's in air traffic, it's in technologies that you use every day that you'd never guess NASA has something to do with it. It's in NASCAR and Formula One. We have so much more going on on Earth than ever in space. So if you just Google it or you can go straight to our website, nasa.gov, NASA Home and City, it'll take you on this really cool interactive flash opportunity to show you everywhere in your immediate home that NASA inspired technology has implemented or impacted your wife, your life. And the cool thing is you would be surprised that the water filtration systems that are used today are direct impact from NASA. So I would suggest taking a look at what we do right here on earth. And, and then Joe can talk about extraterrestrial stuff. Well, oh, I love this. <laughs> and if, if, if our friends type Napa, it's almost NASA with an S. So we almost, oh, yeah. we'll make sure we re redirect it to NASA. <laughs> yes. Well, what she, she forgot to tell you is that if you guys have an idea, it doesn't matter how old you are, you might not have tell a us. research and development uh, team behind you, but you can think of NASA as your research and development, mm -hmm. and you can look at their portfolio of technology to solve any problems. If yes. you want to have a filtration system, look at NASA. You can license that technology and start your business. Or you can use some of it for free just to test it out. But what I would like to say to everybody is every moment is a moment, and it's very precious. And you should love your neighbor. You should enjoy life. You should respect everybody all over the world. We would not be able to do what we do here at NASA if it wasn't for the international cooperation, mm -hmm. if it wasn't for the diversity of our workspace. We are probably the happiest workplace in the US government by far than any other 
and you can look it up and you can see people stay working at NASA. They're, I've had this job all my life and I will have it all my life. And so does almost everybody that works. With me. I work for a guy who actually was the first uh, graduate student for Carl Sagan. He's been there his whole entire life. In fact, one guy just retired. He was 94, 94 years, years old. Years I'm old. like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> and so the, the thing is, if, if you're a kid or even an adult who thinks that NASA is really cool, look us up and try to get a job. There's enough for everybody. And we, we have internships even through the pandemic. We have chefs that actually make food that basically in space, you can't have crumbs. <laughs> so like talk about a criteria, right? You think about that constraint. You have to design food that doesn't make crumbs because if you did make crumbs, they would go all over the spacecraft and get stuck in all kinds of different things. So, so there, it doesn't matter your passion. We do chemistry, we do robotics, we do inspiring kids, educators. We have educators. So, uh, we have winemakers. Yes, we do. <laughs> I'm volunteering to be the next one. I'm putting my wings, dear friends. And I cannot thank you enough on the spur of the moment as friends with such a brain, such an amazing way to explain our galaxy and systems that you, you know, so kindly, gener generously donated an hour of your time to be with us tonight. So I'm going to take my glass of wine ah. and I know we're going to phone each other in about half an hour and I'm going to be with our daughters and you're going to show us where to look so that we can be all eyeing to the horizon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, and one more thing. Tomorrow is a big meteor shower, the Earth's meteor shower. So everybody, it's not done tonight. Tomorrow there's a big show as well. So it's just, all kinds of just wonderful Christmas gifts. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than a, you know, human fireworks. It's happening in a natural way. We love it. And, and we have friends in high places. Just remember, that's the one thing about NASA. We have friends in high places. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. And happy holidays. Happy and we'll holidays. be looking together. And thank your wonderful staff for helping out. They thank do a great you. job. We love you guys.